You know, back in the day with boxing, the media could build you up and break you down so quickly, your head would be spinning. Now, numerous fighters got that coverage back mid-1970s and mid-1980s, especially in the Ring Magazine, Royal Boxing, the other public publications. But this guy is a prime example is that when someone overachieves, the media is going to find a way to criticize in every way possible when they don't continue at that level. So today we're talking about the kosher butcher, the Jewish bomber, and probably one of the, the most interesting uh, folk heroes of his generation, uh, Mike Rossman. Now, Mike Rossman, uh, for us growing up in the 1970s, was a top 10 contender for quite some time, fighting on a lot of major undercards involving Ali and other key uh, fighters. Now, he was born Michael Albert de Piano on July 1st, 1955. He won the WBA Light Heavyweight Champion of the World against the great uh, longtime champion Victor Galindez in 1978 uh, on the second Ali Spinks uh, fight undercard. Now, he is both Italian and Jewish descent, which led to his monikers, the Kosher Butcher and the Jewish Bomber. Now, like Max Payer, he wore a Star David on his trunks. He was uh, well known for his uh, aqua blue trunks. He became a very popular photograph uh, for people in uh, New Jersey, New York, because he became um, kind of a folk hero. Now, born in Turnersville, New Jersey, uh, Rossman is his mother's maiden name, which he uses rather than his father. Uh, Rossman's father was Italian, and his mother Jewish. Now, he is Jewish, and boxed with a star David on his shorts for the majority of his career. He began boxing at 14, and turned pro on August 10th, 1973. Now, those early fights uh, drew a lot of interest. He was fighting mostly in Philadelphia, his home region, also in Baltimore, Atlantic City, Scranton, uh, uh, various uh, locations. But the Spectrum was his uh, most popular venue. He had a draw against Nate Dixon in 1974, which drew a lot of interest. Now, by the time that the uh, uh, the mid-1970s uh, uh, rolled around. Uh, he was going on an undefeated uh, streak. He uh, fought uh, Mike Nixon. His first loss, 21-1-1, won the rematch, then fought the great uh, light heavyweight contender Mike Corey, losing an animal decision at the Nassau Coliseum in uh, 1975. But uh, on the turn, he kept on um, uh, uh, drawing uh, good fights, won a rematch against Corey by majority decision in 1976, and then won a, a third fight, a, a return to the return, against Mike Corey at Madison Square Garden in 1977. Now, uh, even though uh, he lost to Yaki Lopez at the Fell Forum uh, on... Um, uh, March 2nd, 1978, we knew he was being groomed for a title fight. We did not know was it was going to be against Galindez, because Galindez was having a hard time holding on to the title because he had the great Marvin Johnson, uh, Matthew uh, Franklin, Matthew Saad Muhammad, and Eddie Gregory, Gregory Eddie Mustafa Muhammad, uh, what do you call, breathing down his neck. Now, there was some controversy that Rossman got that title fight in the Superdome card, again, Ali Spinks too, because a lot of people felt that uh, there was much deserving uh, contenders. Now, in that fight, I watched it, Rossman dominated for majority of the, uh, the fight. Many thought Galindis would defeat him, but Rossman, uh, using his accuracy, opened up cuts over Galindis' eyes and continued fighting until the end of the 13th round when the referee stopped the fight and Rossman became world champion uh, with the expression at the end of the fight, the kosher butcher has struck. Now, the fight itself, some people were saying that Galinda is through the fight because of uh, Rossman's connections. I don't believe that. Uh, that's an awful beating he took over 13 rounds because Rossman's accuracy, 5'11", with a nice 73-inch reach, he could, he could uh, work his author orthodox style to damage her opponent. Now, Rossman eventually made one successful defense before his hometown Philadelphia fans in December of the same year, after the September fight, stopping Italian challenger Aldo Travesero in the fifth round after opening a wound on Aldo's forehead with a left hook. Now, 
uh, the rematch was scheduled for February 1979. Now, it's also considered one of professional boxing most embarrassing moments, at least in modern times. At a scheduled rematch between Rossman and Galindez, Rossman was left waiting in the ring as Galindez failed to appear. A dispute about the judges of the match between the WBA and the Nevada Athletic Commission prevented the fight from being for the title, so Galindez is ca can't refuse the fight. After immediate attempts to remedy the situation failed, the fight was suspended and uh, rescheduled two months later in April 1979. Now, with Rossman perhaps still fighting up a boxing politics, Galindez was focused on regaining the title and was able to defeat Rossman. Uh, Rossman apparently broke his right hand during the bout, severely limiting his boxing ability in the fight. The pain became worse over the course of the match and unbearable to a point where Rossman told his father manager after the ninth round he could not continue. Unfortunately, again, he gave up the belt. Now, he was eventually inducted in New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame. Now, uh, this is where it became extremely controversial. Uh, he decided to go back in the ring five months later, again, in a tune-up fight against one Raymond Ranquilla. Now, uh, Raymond wasn't the greatest fighter in the world, a very good club fighter, but Rossman felt, you know, you got to keep active. And Ranquilla knocked Rossman out in the seventh round. Now, Rossman had, uh, uh, you know, two wars with Galindez, really hurt himself in the second fight. But the media turned on him. They basically chastised him in Ring Magazine, the New York Press, the Pennsylvania Press, like how dare you lose uh, a fight against a non-entity uh, after, you know, beating uh, the five-year or six-year world champion of the world. Now, Rossman undeterred. He made uh, a short comeback. He was fighting at Resorts International Atlantic City and uh, different fights in Chicago. Won two matches against Luke Capuano, Al Bolin, Don Addison. But... The mistake in his career, he took on the, uh, the the guy that at the time was one of the most dangerous lightweights and cruiserweights of his era, Dwight Brax and Dwight Bahama Kai, the guy that Evander Holyfield once said was the toughest fighter ever he fought. Kawhi, Kawhi uh, destroyed him uh, in 1981, shouldn't have took the fight, and again, that's kind of ended his career. He had four more wins between 1983, uh, mostly in 1983, over seven months, mostly Atlantic City, but because of the negative publicity and the, the amount of people that thought he was washed up, I didn't think he was washed up, but like I said, he had fought some of, some of the, the toughest light heavyweights and cruiserweights of his era. But the media that were really bad at him would not forgive him for doing what Marvin Johnson, Eddie Gregory, Matthew Franklin, Yaki Lopez, Buddy Johnson, other top contenders could do. Again, that was beat Victor Galindez. They saw Victor Galindez beatable, but it had to be against a top five contender. At best, Rossman was top 10 or top 15. Very good quality fighter, but he was fighting, you know, some, some really uh, dangerous, taking some dangerous fights. Like uh, Yaki Lopez, that the TKO lost in 78 at the Felt Forum. I mean, within uh, within six months, he was world champion. And Gary Summers gave him everything he could handle in uh, the Shavers undercard against Ali in uh, in 77. And like I said, those fights against uh, Chris the Elliot as well were 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 pretty dangerous. Uh, Tony Lasita, which he lost a uh, tough uh, majority decision. Uh, Al Styles as well in Scranton. Mike Nixon, uh, you know, back to back fights. Matt Donovan, back-to-back fights. You know, he was he was taking on top 20 and top 15 contenders all the time. But Rossman had good movement. He had uh, uh, good accuracy. But when I watched that fight against Galindez, uh, my dad was with me. And dad said, if Galindez doesn't knock him out after five rounds, keeps on coming, keeps on coming. He was the closest thing that the light heavyweights had to Rocky back in the day. And... Uh, technically, Galindez was ring champion or a lineal uh, uh, champion, and uh, let me let me tell you, Galindez was a tough nut because I I would suspect uh, Galindez at one uh, point fought some of the uh, the top contenders. He had uh, Pierre uh, uh, Fury uh, for a while. He won the vacant title by being Len Hutchins. But what really what really stood out for me. Ladies and gentlemen, 
when he was fighting in uh, uh, different uh, uh, locations around the world, he do a non-title fight. He once did a non-title fight against a fighter whose nickname was Communist, Communist Roy Elson. I watched that fight, and like I said, he took it everybody, Democrats, Communists, uh, different people. But what happened with Galinda, and that's why it pissed a lot of people off, he defeated Eddie Gregory, right? He defeated uh, Yaki, Yaki Lopez to retain the title, and uh, eventually got knocked out by Marvin Johnson. But not saying he was ducking Matthew Franklin, but, you know, you, you, you smelled something going on. But uh, that, that win over Eddie Gregory was uh, extremely controversial. Uh, because he would fight in Italy. A lot of uh, South Americans would fight in Italy and get the judges on their sides. So, but Mike Rossman, again, a top 50 light heavyweight uh, of the 19, uh, uh, of, of all time. You can't win a title unless you're good. But like I said, uh, with all those venues, Feldform, Spectrum, you know, he was, a, he was a hometown hero. And Nassau Coliseum, that first loss against Mike Quarry in uh, 1975, that was a rockin' fight. I guess there was thousands of people in there. Some were Quarry fans, some were, uh, uh, some were Rossman fans. But like I said, uh, I, I became a boxing writer later on, and I always thought myself, just because a certain fighter doesn't meet expectations now, doesn't mean he can bury him. I don't know what he had to hate on for him, and the British press was like that too. I read an article that said he did deserve to have the title. Well, if Galindez wanted to keep the title, he should have fought better. That's the way it goes. So this is our latest on our Vintage Boxing Podcast. If you like what we're doing here, give us a like, comment, and subscribe. If any thoughts of the, the late 1970s light heavyweight division, and it was talented. And James Scott as well, who was in the mix, our uh, top 10 contender in Rawway Prison. Let us know. Anyway, now this podcast is dedicated to my, uh, my good buddy, the boxing champion, Derek Hamilton, who basically always appreciates when I do a boxing podcast. So, Derek, thanks for the support. This is for you, brother. Have a good day. Bye.